Eric, GoDaddy's well known primarily in the domain business, but um, there are some other aspects to your business as well. Yeah. Can you tell us what uh, the business is? Yeah, and we really, uh, most people, how, how many of you know us from Super Bowl commercials? By the way, we're going to get to that. <laughs> how many of you know us for anything but Super Bowl commercials? All right, cool. so a lot less hands there. So, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's a phenomenally interesting story of our company. Um, we do, we are the world's largest domain provider. Uh, we have uh, about 13 million people across the globe with about 60 uh, million domains under our purview. Um, what does that mean? That means 20% of the internet runs through us, which is a pretty staggering number globally. Uh, and while people who do know us for more than Super Bowl ads know us for domains, uh, we have spent the last couple of years really focusing in on our product suite and really um, taking the marketing and all the goodness that's come from our marketing in terms of brand awareness and how do we transition that to a message that's more product driven. So yes, we do have websites built, uh, we do have domains, but we have a website building product, we have hosting, uh, we have SSL, we have uh, an invoicing system called Get Paid. Uh, we have a, an SEM product called Get Found. Um, so we, we literally have 20 to 30 products, uh, all again tailored uh, to the very small business. It's almost a micro business. Um, once people get five or seven employees, they tend to go to more of a professional based uh, designer type of approach. But um, if you're just starting out, a new business, or if you're, you know, what we find is a lot of people who, who buy a domain and start a website, they may not want an e-commerce platform attached to that, but um, they may be a fan of uh, photography. They might be an avid photographer and they may have just a, a photography website. So um, that's who we're really trying to, to focus on. From a marketing perspective, it makes it hard um, because for us, domains are the front door to our business, uh, unlike some of our competitors who may say the website building tool is the front door. Um, the domains are our front door, but when you take a look at the small business owner, um, I wish they were all in a particular region of the country, or yep. I wish they were all a particular demographic. Uh, but the truth is, it's, uh, it's the 23-year-old who can't find a job in San Mateo, although maybe in San Mateo is a bad example, but uh, you know, maybe here in Phoenix, or it's the 42-year-old woman who's trying to start a, um, a resale clothing line in Topeka, Kansas, or it's the 57-year-old gentleman who has spent 30 years in the white-collar world, took a couple clients with him, and formed his own little consulting gig. Um, so, it, it, while it's not a huge portion of the United States, what makes it infinitely harder is those people are all over the place and they look like everyone. So how do we take limited marketing funds yeah. and get those people? Yeah, and you also have to do it on a global scale, right? You're not and we have to do it on a global scale, yeah. So. Our business is increasingly global. Um, what we call our tier one markets, markets that get um, a good deal of brand support. It's Canada, uh, beside the US, Canada, Mexico, uh, the UK, Brazil, um, uh, India, and we're going to be launching efforts in Turkey, Australia, and China uh, in the back half of 2015. So with such a big, diverse business, globally, segment-wise, et cetera, um, last month you had to deal with uh, Super Bowl, and yes. I think everyone sort of knows the, the, the front story of the Super Bowl ad, but what was the back story? Uh, the backstory. Uh, I love the fact that Ad Age put out a poll and 53% of the people thought that it was part of an, a well orchestrated plan. So uh, I'm going to leave it at that. Uh, <laughs> to say that we, we appreciate um, the more than half of the, of the smart marketers who thought it was actually done on purpose. So we'll just uh, we'll, we'll leave it at that. And, and, our, our CEO was on record as saying it wasn't the case. So we'll <laughs> stick with that. Okay, and you also you have an interesting background. So you, you actually worked at the NBA. You understand yeah. sports marketing, content, and, and you're actually teaching at ASU yeah. here locally. Um, it's been how, a, how does that affect your life? It's been a long journey, I, I got to tell you. I, uh, I started on the agency side, on yeah. the buying side, and then I went over to the sales side, spent most of my uh, career on the sales side, and... Uh, 
coupled that was two trips working at the league office in the NBA and uh, then been on the client side for about uh, the last four years. So um, as we, we just hired a new agency in the U.S. in January and I and they used to work with me at my previous company and they know I'm their worst nightmare because I was them. Uh, I was the salespeople who tried to get around them and yeah. then now I'm their client. So uh, it's been an interesting journey, but man, I tell you, uh, it's been fun because um, I've seen all sides of the business. Um, and again, um, on the selling side, had the ability to work in network TV and syndication. Uh, I spent five years at Clear Channel doing a cross promotional kind of cross organizational role there where it was radio and outdoor and live events. We still owned uh, what is now Live Nation at the time. So uh, really working uh, at Clear Channel and with at, at the NBA with working with some of the top marketers in the world and really trying to just take in as much as possible. And you know whether it was Amex or T-Mobile or uh, Bilbo in, in Brazil or Mongolian milk in China and working with uh, all these really smart people all over the world. Um, you know, I was taught by my uh, my academic advisor in college that you know you don't learn anything when your mouth is moving. So uh, I spent a lot of my time just listening, and uh, hopefully now I can bring some of that to bear. In so this you get to work home. with the college students yeah. every day. Um, a lot of them are the people we're trying to recruit into yeah. our companies and organizations. What what um, advice would you give your students, and what advice would you give the people out here in terms of uh, finding talent and nurturing talent and, yeah. and, and motivating those people. Yeah, and I teach, uh, I, I, I teach at ASU, I teach within the journalism school, and uh, I actually teach a class that kind of dovetails sports marketing and the economics of media. So it's two things that I've kind of grown up with, and uh, it's the most rewarding thing that I've ever done. Um, you'll never feel so old and so young at the same time. Uh, when you're talking to, <laughs> to a 20-year-old kid on Monday at 8 o'clock in the morning, um, at what is usually still renowned as a, one of the biggest party schools in the country. Uh, although I don't think my students really take, that, that, take advantage of that too much. But um, a lot of my class is really spent on real life because I'll get students who are either graduating that semester or the following semester and they're terrified. I, I have to be honest. Um, m none of them have jobs waiting for them. Um, so a lot of what I do is really give them a really objective look at what's coming uh, and what they need to be prepared for. So uh, like I said, you know, you don't learn anything when your mouth is moving. I try to teach them that. Um, I'll get very tactical from my sales perspective. It's about getting that first interview and or how do you prospect to get an interview and then once you get the interview, what do you do in there? You know, I tell them that you know if you're lucky enough to get in to see somebody nowadays, because it's so hard, um, they don't look around their office, pictures of the wife, pictures of kids, pictures of trips, anything to get the person that they're interviewing with to talk. And what I tell them is the more you're talking, the worse your interview is going. And you really need to uh, be prepared for that. And I also tell them, uh, you know, if they're one of a hundred people being interviewed, I would almost guarantee that 99, the other 99 are gonna just regurgitate what's on their resume. And what I emphasize with them is to say, you know what, learn what they need, because it's not about, they, they honestly don't care what you've done. They care about how can this person help me. And if you don't have that understanding, you're gonna be just like every one of the other candidates they talk to. But if you can come in with a plan or a strategy to help them, then you've probably differentiated yourself. And you may not get the job, but you're certainly going to be uh, in a different skill set. But you know, it's funny. A lot of them just agonize over every word in their resume. And that's because the, their first all of their life, it's always culminated in the resume. And they're, they're very disheartened to learn that now resumes are really just an SEO document. Yeah. And people are looking for three or four keywords. And if your resume doesn't have those three or four keywords, it's going into the trash. And the sad thing is you don't know what those keywords are. So um, I spent a lot of time with them just trying to get them prepared. Uh, but, you know, they're so digitally savvy. It's, uh, it's incredible. And it maybe just be the ones uh, who I teach, but it's in a journalism school, a well-respected journalism school, and I tend to get kind of the creme de la creme. But 
they're so industrious, they're so digital socially savvy, and that's where the jobs are coming from. You know, they're, they're not hiring too many people at the Arizona Republic downtown. They're yeah. hiring from little social media companies doing things locally down here in Phoenix. And, you know, I tell them if you're one for a hundred or if you're one for one in a job interview, the only number that matters is the number left of the colon. And the number to the right doesn't mean much. So how do you bring those skills together? Um, you know, your sports marketing, your media background, yeah. your, your teaching. Yeah. What, what are the things that um, you can get to apply every day? Yeah, so m most of my students, and I think I've, when we've talked to, to some of the great folks here, we kind of had this conversation. Most of my students want to be in sports. Um, they see that as kind of their career path, but they really don't know what it means to work in sports. So they think it's working for a team. And, you know, a lot of them have internships where they're the kids shooting the T-shirt the cannon in the sixth inning at the stadium, right? So that's, <laughs> and, not, and, you know, for them, it's great, it's great experience, right? It's something that separates them. Um, but that's their worldview of what it takes to work in sports. So what I do is I make a very concerted effort. And again, given my background, I've been lucky enough to have a lot of contacts. Either I'll bring in guest speakers who are agents, or on the client side, or on the vendor side, or even on the league or the team side, just to give them a more 360 view of what it takes to work in sports, because I, I ultimately the conversation tends to drift into media, because that's my yep. background. Yep. And just like I was, um, they are shocked that there's, that there's this category of employment, because nobody's ever told them that this exists. And it's pretty cool. And if you're in it long enough, there's probably some good money at some point. But if you're never aware yep. that the opportunity exists, I remember my first job, I was applying for uh, associate editor at Fairchild Publications. And uh, my limited resume was advertising in college, you know, selling classified ads for the local newspaper or whatever. And the woman who looked at my resume said, you know, I think you're a good candidate here, but your resume is advertising. Why aren't you looking at that? And I said, I got $38 to my name. I just need a job. I really was just needing some money. And she said, you know what? A friend of mine who used to work here just went over to an ad agency. And if you don't mind, I wouldn't mind sending her your resume. And I was like, well, as long as it's not going to cost me over here. And um, she was, um, so I interviewed at NW Air, an agency that no longer exists. But uh, I started in the network negotiations division. I had no idea what that was. And my first day at work was... Uh, the Earthquake World Series game with the, uh, the Giants and the, um, the A's. And, uh, and I started seeing this whole world. And you know it was kind of like television, money, and like poker. Like you're gambling with other people's money about television. And I loved, I loved all three individually. And I couldn't, <laughs> couldn't believe that there was a job that actually combined all of those. But uh, again, as a student, you don't, you don't know it. So uh, you know, I, I've... Uh, Probably in, a, in what's been very rewarding, the most rewarding thing is I've probably gotten, I think I'm up to 11 of my students' jobs uh, okay. in, the, in the five years that I've been teaching. So, uh, and that's great because they're very appreciative um, and I still remain friends with a lot of them. And now I'm using alumni of the class to help the new crop of people who are graduating. So I've kind of built this little incestual network too, which is kind of hopefully benefiting everybody. Yeah. And um, just going back up to GoDaddy for a minute. So, so as you build the brand globally, obviously you, you mentioned Super Bowl ads. Yeah. What's the plan overseas? Because obviously there is no Super Bowl. No, there is well, none. Although um, a lot of people do tune in, but that's not your core. No, it's not. Actually, in Brazil, they don't care about the game, but they love the commercials. Yeah. So for Brazil, that's a whole thing about Super Bowl commercials. But it's, uh, it's very challenging. Um, when you look at our markets, we've got more defined markets, if you will, the US, Canada, the UK, uh, where it's really about a share. You know, it's fighting for share of the audience. And then you've got Brazil and India and Mexico, where it's about generating awareness and kind of riding that emerging market train. And uh, the challenges are very difficult. Um, the, the difference in syndicated research, you know, we have agencies in, in all of those regions. and. We push them very hard to help us again segment and try to reach the people that we're trying to reach. But um, the methodologies are different. The, the the availability of research is very different. Uh, but the consumers are very different. Again, I think we were talking that you know in India, 
they skipped the 20th century. Yeah. So they don't have a TV or a radio. Everything's locked up in their mobile device, and that is their TV. And you have to know how to, to market at the mobile level, but at the same time, you have to have a user experience, a registration path that's every bit as good as your marketing. So it's, uh, it's a challenge. Um, things we take for granted in the US, um, not using credit cards in markets, that they don't do credit cards. And how do you have an e-com business without credit card transactions? So how do you have an e-com business without? <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, uh, boy, we're still trying to figure that one out okay. in a couple places. It's, yeah. uh, it's not easy um, cashing checks and uh, things like that. It's, uh, but you know, when you've got a, a billion four in India, you, you, you better figure it out. Yeah. Because if we're not going to, our competition surely is. So. Great, great. So um, do you have any other points that you want to tell the audience or advice that you'd like to give? No, nah, you know, and just, it was such a great conversation over the last couple of days. It's really been enjoyable. And I think when, when I kind of synthesize what we try to do, um, for me it comes down, I can do it in four words. It's whoever, however, whenever, and wherever. And I think as marketers, that's kind of the goal that we need to shoot for in terms of reaching our, our audience or our customers. It's, you know, there's the days of us having control uh, of the customer experience is, is long gone. Yeah. And now it's about using the right tool set, the right people. I think tools are great, but it's, it's ultimately working with the right people um, to use those tools to make sure that we're able to reach people wherever, whenever, and however they want to be reached. Great. Well, thank you very Great. much, and thank, thank you. you for standing here. We appreciate it. Thank you. Take care. Thank you.